I'm Kari, and I'm here with my co-host, Natalie, and we are thrilled to welcome you back to Instinct, a podcast about leadership one animal at a time. This week, we're dive bombing into the wonderful world of hummingbirds. You'll hear why hummingbirds are the animal icon of startups. They look small and innocuous, but their fierceness and laser focus might just surprise you. We'll also get into some fun details about their super differentiated beak and how it allows them to make fewer decisions and stay alive longer. So if you are a leader who wants to move faster, and of course you are, then this episode has some great nuggets for you. Let's get into it. Kari, hello again. Hey, Natalie. It's good to see you. And we are back with our next conversation and our next animal that we're going to learn from today, which is the magical hummingbird. I'm really excited to talk with you about hummingbirds in particular, because I know they're very special to you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. I think the more that people know I like hummingbirds, the more they see me as a hummingbird, which I'm not sure is exactly how I want to be seen, but I'm just going to take it as a compliment. Well, maybe we could dig in today into the ways in which that's a compliment and the ways in which maybe it's not a compliment. Yeah, my frenetic energy and speed of like 30 miles an hour and everything. All right, let's dive in. Okay, let's do it. But Okay, but I want to hear I want to hear about hummingbirds, but before we hear about hummingbirds, can we hear a little bit about you and hummingbirds' significance sure. in your life? I'd love sure. to hear about that. Really, the main significance is that a couple years ago, there was a hummingbird that made a nest in a tree just outside this window that you can almost barely see. And I think the significance was that, first of all, I noticed it. Uh, hummingbird nests are quite small, as you can imagine. But bigger than that, <laughs> literally everything's bigger than that. But <laughs> what I meant to say is that beyond how small they were and the fact that I noticed I think they repre it, that represented for me that like I was paying attention more to what was around me instead of just kind of like having total focus on just what's going on inside of me and how loud my brain can be sometimes. So hummingbirds are kind of meaningful to me, not only because they're amazing creatures, but also because they kind of remind me to like pay attention to what's going on around me, see the things that are not necessarily obvious or like the biggest things right in my face and also to really like savor the the beauty that's actually everywhere around us hummingbirds represent that for me it's a little bit ironic that hummingbirds for you represent paying attention almost like slowing down <laughs> noticing the beauty but hummingbirds themselves are not slowing down or noticing the beauty around them and are quite utilitarian <laughs> which I think is kind of interesting. That's a good point. You know, one of the fun things about this concept of going through all these animals is that what an animal means to you might be different than what it means to me and how I want to sort of like apply it in my own life might be different. So maybe maybe hummingbirds, despite being fast, feel like slow compared to my internal world sometimes. Oh. <laughs> so let's let's get into it. So let's share some facts about what we know about hummingbirds based off our research. I will start since Great. they are my faves. So first things first, there are a lot of hummingbird species out there. We're not really going to dive, I don't think, into any specific one species or the other, but we should know that there's a lot. Most of them are in South America. We actually only have a couple here in North America. They're awesome, but we don't know about all of the various hummingbird species around the world. We, I didn't certainly get that deep in my research. So there's a lot of them. And it really interestingly, I think hummingbirds are some of the sort of youngest evolved in relative age birds in the bird, I don't know, <laughs> group, the bird group. That's the thing. Um, meaning that like their origins only date back, I think, like 20 million years versus other birds and, like dinosaurs and all that. It's like hundreds of millions of years ago. So they're actually a relatively young species in the bird in the bird group. I should really figure out what the grouping is called. So let's just start with that. There's a lot of species, but they're also relatively new species in the grand scheme of things. 
that somehow intuitively makes sense to me. I was trying to imagine, you know, there's like a brontosaurus and a triceratops. And then somehow in that image, there's a not a hummingbird and it just <laughs> makes sense. <laughs> yeah. I think they're kind of a, you know, just like computers, they started out to being like in giant room that a computer is in. And now the computer is very, 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 very small. That's the hummingbird. So evolution. Although phones are going the opposite direction. So maybe in another thousand years, we're going to have giant hummingbirds again <laughs> with big screens on their fronts. That actually sounds terrifying. Imagine a hummingbird like blown up to huge dinosaur size. That would not bring me calm and resolve and peace. So let's keep them small for now. Okay. So what are some other basic facts about the hummingbirds that we should know about? I I mean, the ones that the, that we kind of see around here in in the United States in particular, you know, are like two or three inches long. They're pretty small. Yeah, not too big. Yeah, something like Sounds that. Right. Uh, and there's some variety, right? There's the bumblebee hummingbird. I don't know what that one is, but it sounds cute. It's really small. And then there's some that are a little bit bigger, but that's basically it. So they're they're pretty small. Uh, and I think they're really well known. Most of us probably know them because of the way that their wings work. How do their wings work? The way that I thought about it before I did my research was that I just thought that they were flapping their wings really, 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 really fast, mm -hmm. which is not untrue. But I also learned, and I think you know more about this than me, that they can fly forward, backward, sideways, all directions. And they do that by making a figure eight pattern with their wings. So cool. So cool. Yeah, they're like basically treading water, but air. They're treading air. They're like tiny water polo players in the air. Yeah. And they're the only ones. They're the only vertebrae who can hover. Yeah. That's pretty Which, cool. It is pretty cool. And the hovering actually, besides being just like, cool and technologically advanced and a unique differentiator compared to other animals enables something for them, right? So when they, because they can move in all these directions, they can sort of hover and the hovering allows them to have access to other flowers that other birds might not. So there's a reason why they developed that, that I think scientists call convergent evolution, which is basically like two things evolving in the same I'm going to call it like same direction. I don't know if it's at the same speed, but kind of in relationship to each other. And so this hovering kind of co-evolved with the sheep of the flowers that they pollinate, which is really cool. I think it's really cool. So their beaks grew and the shape of their beaks grew and the hovering happened so that they can access flowers that other birds can't basically. Which is super important because hummingbirds are completely obsessed with food. Mm. And they, <laughs> another thing I relate to. <laughs> yeah, I've, I've uh, observed that about you in your snacking, uh, snacking. There's literally snacks on my desk right now and it's taking a <laughs> lot of willpower to not grab one and just munch as we talk about the un insatiable hummingbird. Okay, so to be fair, they have to eat all the time because it's expensive to do what I just said mechanically, which is all that like hovering and moving about and flitting about the cabin, right? So they have to eat like, what is it? Like every 20 minutes or something like that? They have to eat every 20 minutes. And I think I read in it, I think it's different a little bit between hummingbirds, but if they go an hour without eating, they can die. <laughs> Sorry, I shouldn't laugh, but <laughs> it's I really mean, extreme. They're, they're little, but it also means they have to go to... 2000 ish flowers a day. Wow. Wow. Okay, wait. So like a uh, a flower is like a very small fraction of something that will satiate them every 20 minutes. Yeah. It's kind of like eating a potato chip. But I, <laughs> I think it's even smaller than that. 2000 potato <laughs> chips. <laughs> Maybe it's like a sunflower seed. It's like smaller than that. Yeah, I think it's like if we ground up, you know, I've got checks Mix here. If we ground up like this checks into like 10 parts and ate one of those at a time, mm -hmm. that's what it would be like. Very, very unsatisfying. Mm -hmm. But I think that this, this feeding pressure has led to a lot of really interesting things about the hummingbirds. For example? Well, you mentioned that they're highly differentiated 
and that they co-evolved right with these flowers and that some hummingbirds are incredibly specific about which flowers they drink nectar from and which ones they don't. Mm. And it makes sense in a way because if you have to drink nectar from 2000 flowers a day, you have to have those things be accessible to you, which means you can't be busy competing all the time or like trying to find the flowers. So it seems to me that mm. hummingbirds are incredibly organized. They really rely on routine. They go to the same places over and over and over and over again. Right. Uh, and like no energy can be wasted in the process of getting food. I guess the equivalent would be like if I had to figure out t- two, not two, 2,000 different restaurants to eat at yes. in a day, and they had all these like specialized rules about them, that would be very cognitively taxing and exhausting for me versus if it were like, go to the same restaurant, refill, 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 kind of back and forth, that would, I wouldn't have to think about where to go. Is that how I should think about it? Yeah, okay. I think that's right. Okay, that makes sense. One of the other things I found was more about their social behavior. And I feel like this is So it's where this question of like, do I relate or not comes in, but I'll hold Mm. my personal identity for a second. So broadly, I found in my research that hummingbirds are not particularly known to be social creatures, meaning, you know, unlike the wolves that we talked about last, they're not like pack oriented, right? In fact, if you've ever hung up a hummingbird feeder, you might be quite familiar with the hyper competitive nature of those hummingbirds and they like can dive bomb each other and you and like it's all eyes on the prize. So in general, they're not necessarily social creatures. But and here's the I think interesting part. My research, I kind of found that depending on the availability of resources, meaning, you know, is there, are there enough flowers around? Are there enough options for survival? If there's more scarcity, there's, as should be obvious, more competition. If there's less scarcity, then they actually can be kind of cooperative. So I was reading, I think a paper, maybe it was a study about uh, basically the females kind of helping raise the young, even if it's not the sort of birthing, nesting, laying mother that's doing all the work. So normally it's one female hummingbird that builds the nest and protects the eggs and then goes and gets food and comes back and feeds. But if resources aren't scarce, then some people will help, not people, other hummingbirds will help with that, right? They'll come and some will protect the eggs while mom is off getting food and vice versa. So I think what's cool about that is like, it really is resource dependent how collaborative they are or are not. It's interesting that insight next to a couple of the studies that I read and one that I like to quote because Mm -hmm. it was really strong language, which is hummingbirds are, and I quote, the most unsociable and most territorial of birds, period. They do not hang out with other birds. Oh, wow. (laughs) Did it give you any sense of like why besides what I just mentioned about the resourcing? Like, do we know why they're not so social? Well, I think it's about resourcing. Okay. Almost entirely. And I, I was also interested in one of the podcasts I listened to that shared that hummingbirds, some are more optimized for fighting. Oh, or for being territorial. And some are actually more optimized for differentiation. So there are those hummingbirds that have that beak that's the perfect shape for one specific flower. And then some hummingbirds have this beak with like a serrated edge on it that is intended solely for tearing feathers out of other birds. (laughs) (laughs) That is pretty hardcore. It's like organizations whose entire strategy is to just defeat the opposition versus to like build something unique and differentiated on their own. Yeah. And I'm, I'm a little interested maybe to get into that now. What can organizations and leaders learn from hummingbirds? So many things I have. I think I have hummingbird energy right now. Cause I'm like, pew, pew. I'm aware of like all of these different ways we can go. So maybe I'll pause for a second and think about the most important we've already touched on One, which is this concept of differentiation, right? I think there's that phrase, what, differentiate or die? (laughs) 
Yeah. That's like particularly important or seems useful for organizations and business leaders that hummingbirds seem to have figured out the differentiate or die methodology very well. Particularly, they will literally, the thing that they differentiate, which is their beak, if they don't use it effectively to eat all the freaking time, they will die. As you've mentioned, maybe even after an hour. So I think there's something about that, the the technical skills also required for their differentiation, right? This mm. ho- fast hovering uh, kind of treading air situation that's not just like a little bit of a differentiation. It's like no other bird does that. And it might be like hundreds of years before another bird can evolve to that. So it's, it seems to me like a differentiate and a make it hard to copy that differentiation. That's kind of a long-term bet. So that one stands out to me. Yeah, me too. I think that was the first takeaway that I that hit me too, is that even though hummingbirds can eat just about anything, they're carnivores. Mm-hmm. So they can eat bugs. I guess that's it, bugs. I mean, they're pretty little. Yeah. Now, so now I'm like, I don't know what they eat. Yeah. <laughs> they can bugs. eat, yeah. They can eat bugs. Insects. Yeah. Yeah. But they mostly don't, right? They mostly focus on their nectar, f- on the food source in, in the place where they're differentiated. However, they do have this kind of like backup Swiss army knife thing, which is like if they happen across some larva or a mosquito, they can slurp that up too. And interesting. I think it's a really interesting balance to think of in terms of startups, right? being super focused on the one thing that makes you different, but also not letting go of the flexibility or adaptability to survive when needed. Yeah, that and makes it sense. seems like there's something there. That makes sense. Is there any personal application for you on that one, Kari, that you feel comfortable sharing? <laughs> I mean, <laughs> uh, it's an interesting question. It's an interesting question. I don't know if I would consider my business sense to be particularly hummingbirdy, mm-hmm. but if I were going to apply hummingbird wisdom to what I'm up to, mm-hmm. I would say that at the beginning of starting my business, we were pretty niche kind of doing one specific type of coaching with startup founders who were primarily in that kind of mid seed to series a period which Mm -hmm. is a pretty narrow focus right for something as broad as coaching and what what i think allowed us to grow was the adaptability so Mm -hmm. even though we started in a really specific place um i do think that we had to pull a lot of tools out of the toolkit in order to get to the next level including growing with our clients right as like what our client raises a series B and we say, sorry, we can't know you anymore. Uh, right. That was not really the awkward. way that we're off. Yeah. <laughs> it's not the way we're operating. When I ask you that, this question, I didn't have anything specific in mind, but as you've been answering, I, I feel like I see something in you here that maybe I can share with you to see if it resonates, which is most people think about coaching. They have an idea of like one-to-one coaching mm. or they have an idea, maybe a false premise that it's actually like consulting which might be either one-to-one or could be like for a team around a specific thing. But with you, Kari, I think some of our first interactions made it clear to me that part of what you think of coaching, you think of systems, which to me is neither one-on-one nor is it consulting, right? And I think there's like a really interesting differentiation in your own coaching style or the way that you operate in the world by seeing in systems rather than seeing in nodes of the Mm. network. Mm-hmm. And that may or may not like be embedded in everything your company does. But I just see that in you personally as like a source of differentiation about how you see the world. So I don't know if that lands. Yeah, I only drink the system's nectar. Exactly. That's it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And like, I think you know that that's your nectar, right? Both nourishing and um, and sort of what you're searching for, what you're on the lookout for too. Yeah, right? yeah. I think, yeah, try it on, little hummingbird vibes. I like it. Yeah, which makes me think that knowing which nectar you're going for is also really important. I was making this joke in my head. I don't really think you're going to like it very much. But (laughs) Wow, great start, great start. (laughs) 
I kind of think that hummingbirds have a little Steve Jobs in them. Oh, they have a little like black turtleneck situation going on, which is that they they have to eliminate decision making, right? Or eliminate ambiguity. We were kind of talking about that with how many flowers they have to go to. Yeah. And so they go back to the same places over and over and over and over again, which is why if you forget to change that hummingbird feeder or it gets moldy or something, it's pretty devastating for the hummingbirds. Yeah. So, uh, but they, they eliminate all of the ambiguity of needing to find things or know what's going to happen next because everything has to happen really fast and like clockwork. Right. So I imagine them getting up in the morning and like putting on their shimmery little Steve Jobs turtleneck, like with Can their plan for the day. Those? Steve Jobs with a <laughs> shimmery turtleneck though. That would be a vibe. <laughs> Love that for him. <laughs> I don't hate this metaphor. And it's also reminding me that hummingbirds don't actually live very long. Mm. Not to compare this with Steve Jobs. I'm not saying, okay. Anyway, they don't live very long. It's like a three, I think like maybe an average of a three year lifespan, which is pretty short. And yet the innovation and like the leaps that they make over a lifetime to have that kind of differentiated morphology is what they call it. Like how their body is organized and structured is pretty incredible. So it almost seems like they're like differentiate or die and then die. <laughs> and then actually just die. <laughs> and then actually die. But the bet that they're making, right, is like on behalf of the species, we will have like taken a massive step forward, which feels very jobsy and to me. Yeah. Yeah. Who knew that the hummingbirds were also going to, is that something that you felt like you had in common with Steve Jobs? It's like, I feel like you're bonded now through the <laughs> hummingbird mediation. You know, I don't think so, but I will tell you the <laughs> the learning that I think Here's my second learning that I do think I feel some kinship with or some like awe around, which is that hummingbirds are incredibly good at finding the one or two materials that have an outsized impact on their survival. Mm -hmm. We talked about this already with food, but I think a cooler example is actually how they build their nests. Yeah. So their nests are made out of basically two materials spider silk, which is just like spider webs and like lichen or other decorative <laughs> paraphernalia that mostly just goes on the outside to be like, you can't see me. And you basically just take their long beak and like gather and wrap around spider webs. And then like with just their beak and their little teeny tiny feet, <laughs> which by the way, we can't even put trackers on because the trackers are too heavy and they would weigh down a hummingbird. So like very teeny tiny, <laughs> just with their nose and their little feet, they make this incredible little like egg bowl known as a nest <laughs> and it's incredibly strong. So if you've never seen a hummingbird nest, please Google it. Often they're built around like three or four branches that they'll really like embed into the nest for structural integrity. And then really cool, the nest, because it's like kind of spider webby, it can actually expand a little bit as the two, ideally two little baby hummingbirds grow. So here's why I'm obsessed with that. One, very resourceful. Two, expands with growth, right? That's some long-term thinking. Love that. Three, all of that still is for species level survival, right? So they're really thinking about like, what's, what's going to, if I have a short lifespan, like what's that going to increase the likelihood that these two eggs at a time that I lay are going to be able to come to fruition? And I think that's really cool. Aside from the fact that the spider silk itself is extremely strong. So despite the hummingbird being so little, its nest can outlast in the, or like stay structurally sound in a tree for years. Wow. Wow. That's so cool. And if I'm a startup founder, I'm like, what is that spider silk? Because I feel like often in business, we're shifting between strength and integrity and adaptability and the, and nimbleness. Mm -hmm. And it seems like, mm -hmm. yeah, flexibility. It seems like the, the spider silk as a material allows both things. And like, if you're a hummingbird, you do not have time to rebuild that nest as your baby hummingbirds, chicks, mm, baby I don't know. hummingbirds, yeah. as they grow, you don't really have time to rebuild it, right? You have to eat every 20 minutes and 
there's a bunch of stuff going on, right? So and you may not- actually lay more than one clutch is what they're called for the two eggs per season. Right. So it's not just a one and done or two and done for the season. <laughs> you don't have time. You're right. They are so busy. My learning from this or how I think this applies for leaders, not only can you like, what's your spider silk to find, as you've just said so beautifully, but also like more often than not, it's one or two things that will have outsized impact. And mm. I I suffer from, as I think we all do, the just delicious illusion that mm. if I just do more things that are happening simultaneously, then maybe one of them will pan out. But I think hummingbirds, like you're describing the routine, the specificity, they seem to have figured out like which one or two things and just do that and do that very well. And that will have an outsized impact. Can I put a caveat on that? I think it's brilliant. And anyone who's listening should have written that down because (laughs) um, it's so important and causes, I think, the decline of all sorts of companies if you don't. Uh, But there's another thing that's going on right now, I think, in the startup ecosystem in particular, which is that financing is, the conditions for financing are changing. Resources are very scarce. Right. Like the hummingbirds are not helping each other raise their young right now in the startup world. Correct. And there's something else that I think that the, we talked about a little bit earlier that hummingbirds do really well, which is when they go back again and again and again to get nectar to these places and say it's dried up, which is true in the funding landscape in some certain places right now, uh, then they have to pivot or use that adaptability lever rather than their mm-hmm. highly differentiated lever. You That's know, I think fair. that we've seen a lot of startups over the last few years get really good at one thing, not worry so much about revenue, right? Show traction, raise huge round after huge round, going back to the same place over and over and over again. It's like that amazing house down the corner that has 17 hummingbird feeders on it and you just keep going back for more. Well, this year, they only have one hummingbird the feeder. The well runneth dry. So, you know, is it that you start eating mosquitoes or that you use that beak, that differentiation to get the corner on a certain bush? I don't know what it is, but it (laughs) feels like the hummingbirds also have a little bit of wisdom there, which is how to shift into what they do really well and to lean into routine, but also then to break their own routines in order to save their lives. I'm glad you're naming that. Maybe I should tweak my learning here to be less (laughs) about like, you know, find your spider silk and do that really well and more towards at any given one period of time, you might need to be finding one thing and doing that one thing very well, including pivoting, right? And if you're half pivoting and half continuing to go down the same path that you have been going down, it's just a lot to hold Mm -hmm. at one time. And it Mm -hmm. creates often organizational chaos. Mm -hmm. People don't know, like, are are we, are we pivoting or are we should we keep going? We, right? And it creates this sort of tension and paralysis between options. What totally. do you think about that reframe? You buy I it. I love it. Yeah, I buy it. What else I, you got on your learnings I list? It. I feel like I have one more kind of learning here and then maybe a fun fact. Go for your fun facts. I think I've got one more. I'm wondering if it's the same as yours. What's yours? We'll see. So the one more thing we've already also talked about, but it's uh, the what hummingbirds focus on Mm -hmm. is interesting to me. Also, before I started doing the research on hummingbirds this time, I had no idea that hummingbirds fought. I mean, I like saw them like compete, I guess, at a feeder, but I didn't really get the sense that I don't think about them like a hawk or, or, Um, you know, like I don't think about them as like lethal. Right. Animals really. Right. But I was absolutely fascinated by the idea that some of them have that serrated beak versus some of them that have a beak that's meant for drinking nectar. Right. And that they really committed to one path or the other, right? This is like (laughs) that strategy path, which is like, are we competing and we're going to crush our enemies and that's what we're doing? Or are we going to get really good at drinking the nectar from one flower and double down on that? Win that market. Yeah. Yeah. And hummingbirds have really, I think, Beautifully illustrated that by the way that their beaks are constructed. Yeah. And that both strategies are viable, right? Right. That's just the divergence of particular adaptations. Yeah. Yeah. So that was one that I I just thought, yeah, it's not only around, say, product differentiation, but also around strategy. Good point. 
Speaking of, is this speaking of? I don't know. Start us off, but tell us your fun fact and then I'll, I'll redirect us. Well, this came up in my research when I was reading about how fast hummingbirds go. Oh yeah, like 30 miles an hour or something bonkers. Yeah. That's like faster than a fast biker. Can you imagine that? I was actually riding my bike the other day and I almost, I was riding at maybe 20 miles per hour and I felt like I was going really fast and I thought about this. Because you were. I, well, yeah. (laughs) For a human. (laughs) Not as fast as a hummingbird. And when they're in a dive, they go somewhere closer to 40 miles per hour and sometimes up to 60. Yeah. Um, Okay. So I was researching that because I wanted to know how fast they go because that's one of the first things that I Google whenever we... (laughs) <laughs> how, fast? It. how fast is this animal i mean isn't that the first question every startup founder asks uh, like how fast can i go mm, okay, okay so i wanted to know how fast they go and then uh on the way there i learned that during the mating ritual is when the oh, dive okay. bombing is happening they're like showing off their aerial skills for each other in hopes for the female to mate select yeah oh i want you to tell me about mate selecting here in a second because i think there oh. is something okay interesting about that okay but the male hummingbirds dive I, in my head I, i'm calling it dive bombing because they <laughs> dive right at the female and basically try to just like graze her i guess to impress upon her how quickly does that not work for you kari <laughs> <laughs> doesn't work for me either it's, it's like not just, yeah. takes me right back to my 20s standing <laughs> in the bar <laughs> be like dive bombed <laughs> oh man what a spin okay great uh and then if the female selects the male that's the part that i don't really know how that works but there is some selection right the female kind of gets to choose i think so i don't think Something i know much like more that. about it than you just that like yeah they do have some sort of selection right just as sometimes it's like the male chooses sorry no choice for you sometimes yeah. it's the female who's like which of you hummingbirds have the best aerial displays of affection Right. So there's this aerial display. And then if they choose each other somehow by whatever process that is, then they have hummingbird sex, which lasts for about four seconds, mm-hmm. which is very fast. Right. I, I think. And then the male hummingbird immediately goes to another female. And does the same thing. And so I was like, this is like a batching thing. Like they go from flower to flower. They go from female to female. Like they kind of like get on a mode and then just like do that thing. Like almost like a production line or something like that. That's interesting. Which, you know, I don't know what the emotional life of hummingbirds are. I mean, I might feel a little used in that situation. but Right. It's less of a production line, more of a reproduction line. (laughs) Sorry. (laughs) I had to. Uh, okay so is the fun fact the dive bombing or the four seconds of sex i mean they're both kind of fun okay yeah two two fun facts two fun facts okay i've got two more learnings okay here we go they might be a little bit cheesy but i actually think there's some value in them the first is coming back to this idea of resource scarcity we all have resource scarcity every organization i've been in has a resource constraint right? It's just like a part of nature. And we've already talked about how hummingbirds, depending on how many resources are available, will or will not err towards cooperation or collaboration versus competition. Mm -hmm. And I think the learning here is actually for leaders to think about if they have embedded inadvertently a culture where you're noticing a lot of competition, Mm. where you'd like to be promoting more collaboration and vice versa. So I'm not trying to say that collaboration is better than competition. We've already said that they're diverging strategies, both (laughs) viable for survival. But I've definitely been on teams where the vibe feels competitive, but there's this talk about it feeling collaborative or that we need to collaborate more. And I've similarly been on teams where it's very explicitly like we're going to invest in four teams doing kind of the same thing and we'll see which one actually works. And so they're pitting against each other. I think Mm. famously some big companies do this to figure out new business lines. And so for leaders, I think the invitation here is to say like, if you're really noticing that there's competition where you would like to encourage collaboration or vice versa, consider how the perception of resources is influencing the cascading of cultural practices. Beautiful insight. Make you think of anything, anything you want to share or add on? 
I what I really like about what you said is is just highlighting that both both have a home mm-hmm. in business building. I think I'm notorious in our conversations for only liking cooperative and collaborative <laughs> leadership. And I mean, even when I found out that the hummingbirds are tearing out each other's feathers, I was like, oh, I'm so disappointed in you. <laughs> and I'm like, wow, that's that's a vibe, but I respect it. <laughs> I think I'm getting there. I think I'm really learning that there is a place and probably a survival necessity for there to be competition, right? I mean, that's how almost all of the cool features of the animals that we're covering have come to be, is they had to compete in some way. And so I I got it. I get it. And so <laughs> I appreciate that you had a balanced approach there in highlighting both of those. All right. What's your second one? My last one is this. It comes back to this convergent evolution thing, which just to remind us is basically like the flowers and their pollinators uh, grow at the same in the same direction to sort of specialize around each other. Right. So, for example, with the hummingbirds, I think that's like the orchid that's morphology or the way that it's shaped kind of co-evolved with the hummingbird beak so that it can optimize getting the nectar out of orchids, which is kind of cool because orchids are cool, weird shapes. So I think my learning here, here for my learning here, here, mm-hmm. here, here is it's actually about partnership and particularly about being able to find the right partners that can build and grow with you in a way that's mutually beneficial. Sometimes I, you know, I work with co-founders, so I think this is especially interesting, mm. but I also see it like, you know, organization X partnering and with organization Y on two things that feel like each their specialty, but together they can sort of create something better as a whole or where they're kind of plugged in in a unique way. You know, this might be like Microsoft and OpenAI or things like that. So mm-hmm. and as far as like the relational aspect of this, I sometimes see, I'll see if I can think of an example. I see sometimes with co-founders as they're working together that there's this default like assumption that they need to be constantly growing at the same pace. Otherwise, someone's going to lose some power within the organization. Mm. Or I can see that they do this hyper roles and responsibilities divvying up. Like you take this and I take this and then like we'll know who's accountable and who's not. And neither of them feel quite like convergent evolution to me, Mm. which is can we both grow together in our relationship, but also as an organization's leaders in the same direction and sort of in an entwined way without losing ourselves and our uniqueness, but being actually enabling and supportive of each other's growth. I think this is really like kind of nuanced, but really beautiful. If you can really dig into the idea that you can grow together, but not in the exact same specific way. That makes sense. It does make sense. And I was just going to ask you what you think facilitates that. Mm -hmm. And I had a couple of ideas too. I'd love to hear what you think facilitates that. Yeah. Maybe I'll share like an early framework I've been wrestling with here and you can workshop it with me. So in its most vague sense, I think it's like, do you trust each other? But when Mm. I really try to unpack trust. It's like such a jargony word. It's like also a felt sense. There's a couple elements to it. I think there's a daily collaboration compatibility question. Literally, do we operate in a way that is kind of compatible with my partner? It's like, am I cool with how messy you are or how clean I am (laughs) or how vice versa? Are we cool with how we spend money? Does that feel something we can navigate? So there's like a daily thing, right? The second is, do we have the same general idea for the future of Mm. where we're headed? It's like some sort of vision. You know, in a partnership, it might be like, do we both agree that we want to be married or we want to split this 50-50 or we're both going to be career people? Like some, we're going to live in X, Y, or Z place, right? So I think there's some future orientation that needs to kind of be there, which exists in businesses, of course. Stick with me. The third is navigating conflict. Mm. Like, can you actually move through difficulty together? Mm. 
If you can't, it's going to be really hard to like try to make something new like the orchid and the beak. Yeah. Because I don't think of that as being like an obvious, easy thing to do, right? It's actually right. like inciting change, which by definition is hard, I think. Yeah. Okay. So that's, there's three. Let me quickly name the other one. The fourth is, um, do you feel part, both part of a, a collective and still an individual? Like, are you responsible to both yourself and the collective? Mm, right. Because it's not like the beak is trying to become an orchid, right? They're Correct. informing each other, but they're not actually becoming intertwined. Exactly. In the sense of like becoming each other. Exactly. Mm -hmm. And I think I'm forgetting one, but let's stick with those for now. Like daily compatibility, your ability to navigate conflict, your vision of the future, your sense of... I and we in a mm -hmm. thing. What do you think? It doesn't sound like it's a super early framework. It sounds like you've really been <laughs> thinking about this. <laughs> I know, but I, there's another one I'm, I'm missing. Well, so let's come back to your question, though, which is what enables this. I mean, I think those are elements that enable a sort of trust in self, trust in other, trust in us. Mm -hmm. That I don't know. We don't know. Like, do orchids trust do hummingbirds trust? But there's something there that feels maybe possible. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I'm imagining, I'm thinking about like natural selection mm -hmm. in a way, right? Like there's, there's a, if there's co-evolution occurring, like there has to be right. some kind of mutually beneficial thing. Yeah. Like the beak and the orchid are shaping over time through natural selection, kind of what it is that they're creating together, right. which actually means that at any given moment, they might not be totally aligned. Yeah. Right. They might, the, the beak goes in and says like, I couldn't get all the nectar out. And then the next time this whole thing happens, maybe, you know, another flower has a little bit shorter opening and yeah. then it's like, oh, that actually went better. So then the flower got fertilized or is that what it looked? Yeah, pollinated, pollinated better. And yeah. so then, you know, as they go back and forth, they kind of let certain parts die. Right. And it's through actually like these little micro moments of misalignment that that co-evolution happens. Right. There's like this feedback loop, right? Yeah. But the feedback loop maybe coming to the conflict part. Like if that feedback loop looks like conflict, like how dare you be an orchid that does not fit my beak? Then yeah. maybe the orchid goes inside itself and is like, well, ne never mind. Right. And we see that with relationships all the time and leaderships. It's like if it doesn't quite feel right, it's so easy for us to put our defenses up or not think about it as these micro tensions that enable co-adaptation as you're describing it. Right. So there's like a way in which if you can orient towards conflict or in this case, like these small, it didn't quite work out things. If you can orient towards that as like a co-adaptation opportunity. Mm -hmm. I think you're much more likely to, yeah, like co-evolve, <laughs> right? And to to grow as a company is growing. It's so, I'm saying this like it's, oh, that sounds easy. <laughs> it's really hard, yeah. right? But I think that's what we're up to here is describing what if with intention you can take away from these animals. And yeah. I think there's something powerful about this leadership, not being individual, but being like a co- evolving process either with the company or with a specific other person who's leading it with you. I feel like we're closing up here a little bit with a similar irony to how we started, uh -huh. which is even though hummingbirds aren't particularly social, they Ugh. seem to be giving us all sorts of insights on how to be productively in relationship. That's so beautiful. I'm glad you named that because you're right. Like it's so easy to see the the behavior as you know, antisocial and therefore what can we learn about organizations or leadership from it? But you're right. Like in every interaction, there's actually maybe something to mine that's, that can teach us something about how we show up. I just, it just hit me that I have this bias, which is that social or the kind of interactional quality of relationships has to happen between mm. like a human to human or a wolf to a wolf. But right. hummingbirds are actually quite uh, embedded in an ecosystem that has other beings in it beyond just hummingbirds, right? They might not be particularly social unless there's abundance. And then sometimes they're generous with each other. Right. 
But often it's not about their relationship with other birds or other hummingbirds. It's about their relationship to their flowers, right? The, the broader ecology. Yeah. Right. Yeah. It's like they're seeing themselves as a part of a system uh, rather than, you know, even though they look kind of like loners. There you go with your systems differentiated there I go with lens. Them. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel resolved in our, uh, you know, amplification of this beautiful creature. Is there anything else you think leaders or listeners should really put in their back pocket about the hummingbirds before we sign off for the week? I guess my one hummingbird inspirational moment perhaps Mm -hmm. is that I, I actually really do think about hummingbirds as kind of the animal emblem of a startup. Like they move fast, they're really small, they're pretty fierce, right? Mm -hmm. They, they challenge all sorts of birds bigger than themselves, Mm -hmm. which is pretty amazing. Uh, And I totally underestimated them before I did this research. I'm like, oh, they're pretty. I, you know, literally in my head, I imagined that they're like in a Lisa Frank poster, like (laughs) flitting around. (laughs) They're like so colorful and beautiful. And there's like rainbows and all this stuff. And they are beautiful and they are small and delicate, but they're also fierce and inventive and cooperative and competitive and highly complex. And so, you know, I think even if from the outside, our businesses look small and kind of frail, Mm -hmm. uh, that they're being built with the sort of fortitude and complexity and adaptability of hummingbirds. And that feels pretty cool to think about. And you never know if there's a serrated beak in there until it opens its mouth to chomp you up. (laughs) (laughs) And on that note, we will see you for the next episode of Instinct. Thanks for joining this week's show. Thank you to everyone who helped make this season of Instinct possible. Our amazing Kickstarter funders, the team at Supermix who help make sure that this show sounds profesh, John Rossfels for producing our theme music, If you want any more deets on us, the podcast, or past episodes, please visit us at instinctpodcast.com. There you can leave us a note or a review, or you can tell us that we totally messed something up, or maybe even more importantly, you can tell us if we missed something juicy about this week's animal that we should have touched on. We'd love to hear from you. If you liked this episode, subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. And we'll see you next week. (laughs) 